Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Cubase Fundamentals course. We're going to be mixing the bass guitar today and having a bit of a wander around the channel strip uh, inside Cubase. Just before we set, uh, set off on that, if you want to download this project and follow along uh, with all of this as we go, you can either check out the Patreon link in the description below or alternatively click the join button to become a YouTube channel member. Now, the first thing I want to do today before we actually get on to talk about the bass guitar is fix the cymbals. At the end of the last session, I'd mix the drum kit, but one of those things that you come back and hear it and you go, wow, were you ever wrong? Listen to how overly loud the cymbals are. Way too much. So I'm just going to leave that there as part of the static mix for the moment. Uh, we really want to get on to look at the, uh, the bass guitar today and try to incorporate that. And as I said last time, every time we bring a new instrument in, as much as possible, try to keep everything that's already been mixed in. Just a, a quick point on volume levels as well. As things stand at the moment with just the drums uh, in the mix, as a good general rule of thumb, you want to be somewhere in the region of 10, 10 dB, lower than you're going to want when the entire song is mixed. That's obviously completely arbitrary. Um, but I like to have my drums come out at somewhere between minus 20 and minus 24. Now I didn't check the total level last time, but let's just see what it is. So it's the integrated level we're looking at. Minus 23, absolutely fine. So the drums are at a nice um, healthy level. Having said that, the rhythm master is a little bit hot here. So I'm just going to pull that down a tiny bit. And I've also just noticed, what on earth is my master bus doing over here? You know, sometimes, when do these things happen? It's like a naughty child sometimes, every time you take your eye off it, it runs away. Just make sure it's not too loud for you as well. Okay, there we go. Now we're going to be introducing the bass guitar and we're going to be doing some processing on it. But what I like to do before I do any processing at all, apart from unmuting the track, is copy it. I'm going to mute that track. I'm going to call it dry. And that's going to be a reference track. I'm going to be doing some comparison later. And I want to be able to A, B. This is just the way that I prefer to work. There's any number of ways that you can do this process. But I actually like to have two physical tracks and you know I'm going to be able to AB between those two very easily. Now when I say very easily we've got a bit of an issue here because I'm going to want to be able to toggle between the processed and the dry tracks but I want the drums playing all the time. Now what happens if I solo the drums and then bring the bass in, get that going. Now, if I select the dry bass track, it mutes all the drums. Well, we can fix that problem with a thing called Solo Defeat. What Solo Defeat does is to override the solo option entirely. The way we do it is select the tracks in your mixer, engage Q-Link, and now there are two different ways that you can do it. You can either press Control, Alt, Solo, now can you see they're all orange they've got the letter d i also want to do the same on the rhythm master itself so now the entire drum bus is completely outside of the the solo chain so now i'm going to solo the bass guitar but there's the drums select the bass dry track so solo is working i'm now listening to the dry track I'm now listening to the process track but all of the drum tracks are being left completely alone as an alternative for pressing the keys on your keyboard, if you hover over the thing, it'll say hold or press control alt click. So if I just press the D and hold it down, and similarly, see there was a lag there between me clicking the button and it actually turning on, but I just prefer to press the keyboard keys, frankly. Okay, so we're gonna be hearing the drums all of the time now through everything that we're doing. And I've selected a range of the bass guitar that I'm going to play with. So bars 21 to 25, um, 
are fairly active. So when I'm listening to the bass and I'm trying to mix it into the track, it's a nice zone to play with, um, reasonably well played, uh, everything that I want to hear when I'm doing the mixing. Okay, so there's a couple of problems. There's a few things that we want to identify there that we want to improve. What's good about it? Well, it's a big open ringing bass sound. Let's have a look at what the EQ range is of the bass. So here's the fundamentals operating between sort of 1890 to 150. And these big peaks are the ones that we want to accentuate. That's the good stuff. Because it's played live, there's finger pluckings. I want to accentuate them and kind of pick out a little bit of that character of the fact that I'm playing the thing. There's some bad things. Um, there's a load of mush. Now in the, the low mid frequency region, kind of 200, 250 to 500 Hertz, you get this thing called mud, which is it's a perfectly legitimate part of the frequency range. In fact, some instruments live there snares and toms quite often live in that range so it's not like dead space but for live instruments like bass guitars and pianos it adds an awful lot of clutter there's a lot of energy down there that's just unnecessary we'll be able to pull that stuff out and still maintain a lot of the really good character of the sound if you imagine you've got like a limited number of coins if you've got 100 pennies in your in your hand and you get to spend these on your like energy tokens then if you can save a few of those tokens by scooping out some of the unnecessary sound, you get to spend more of your money on the good stuff. So mixing is really about accentuating the things that we like about the sound and de-emphasizing the stuff that we don't like about the sound. Both of those features are equally important. We've also got a weak note just over here. Wasn't particularly well played and you can see it's quieter than the other notes so we're going to want to do something to try to even out those sounds we want the bass guitar to really be quite consistent throughout the entire song so that's our brief we now know what we're trying to do now even though in a previous episode I said I don't tend to use the internal Steinberg channel strip very often there's actually nothing wrong with it and I'm going to use it today I'm going to do most of my processing well all of my processing actually inside this channel strip. What we've basically got is a set of uh, FX, gates and compressors and EQs and all sorts of good stuff. And they all live inside this green line. So wherever you see this green line, imagine you've got insert effects before it, then everything goes into this strip, including the slider and the, the volume level. And once it's come out of the master fader, it has the opportunity to go through yet more effects. And as you hover over these slots, you can see pre-fader and post-fader, but it's much, much more than fader. It's actually the entire channel strip. And the first thing that I'm going to do is move the EQ up to the top of the strip. So you can pick these things up and move them around. Now I'm going to start applying some EQ to this bass to try to make it sound as good as possible. And I'm not going to turn the drums down at any point. It's all about context. So we have a pre-filter. This um, control here allows me to engage a low pass, sorry, a low cut filter or high pass. You see that red zone is frequency that's just gonna be cut out. Now, even though the bass guitar lives around this 100 Hertz region, the kick drum lives in that zone as well. In fact, the kick typically tends to live around 60 Hertz. And these two things are gonna compete. It's one of the big problems of mixing, how to get your bass and kick living together. It's an entire conversation in its own right beyond the Cubase Fundamentals course, but I can just put a little bit of this pre-filter in um, to take some of the lows away. All of this really low frequency stuff down here is very energy filled, but actually not much value to the sound. Now the low cut filter in this EQ is a little bit shallow for my liking. It doesn't really slice enough away. So I'm also going to engage filter number one. So we've got these four separate parametric filters. If we click in this little symbol, we can pick what type of filter it's going to be. And low shelf three is going to suit our purposes quite nicely for this one. What we get with low shelf three, if we 
mess with these controls well enough. Is a nice steep curve. Now the really good stuff uh, for the bass guitar is around 100 hertz. So I'm going to use filter number two here, which I've set to parametric. There's two different types of parametric and it's basically the gentleness of the slope. Parametric two is a little bit steeper. And what we can use that for is to help us bring those low frequencies back. So even though um, filter number one is trying to cut all of that 100 hertz stuff away, filter number two is overriding it. Just get that pre out of the way. It's almost not doing anything, quite frankly. And now we've got this peak at or around 100 hertz. So that's a very basic shape of the kind of thing that I know that I'm looking for but I've got to get the song going really to start hearing the changes that I'm making. So this is with it muted, the EQ is not doing anything. Now I want to start thinking about cutting away some of that muddy rubbish. There I am at 250 hertz. I've basically centered my EQ on the area of concern and now I'm pulling it away just to let you hear what that mud sounds like. It's pretty horrible. All that. Necessary. And then I want to try and accentuate those um, picks that I was talking about. And generally speaking, the pick sound is going to be anywhere between one and a half kilohertz up to three, depending on whether you've used your fingers like I do or a plectrum. But we'll see it. So there's peaks from here. There's peaks up here. Let's have a listen to all of that. There's, you can really hear that standing out. Obviously I'm massively overemphasizing all of this. Don't like that one so much. Quite like it there. And now I'm really sharpening the cue. When I talked about these 100 pennies that we have to spend, I only want to spend a single penny on this uh, pick sound. You know, it's not a huge deal. It's not gonna be a fundamental part of the song. So I don't want the cue too wide where too much of the frequency is being let through. I just want to accentuate that little thing around about here. Now I'll start toggling on and off. You hear all that low energy that's just kind of woofing over the sound. We've cut, cut a lot of it away. Okay, that's a good starting point and that's all it is. This is just a starting point. Now I need to start doing some due diligence to make sure that I'm not being corrupted with um, volume inaccuracies here. If what I've done here is resulting in a much louder sound than the unprocessed one, that's gonna be making it sound better to my ears and it's got nothing to do uh, with, the, with the EQ settings themselves, it's just volume. And we had an instance of supervision on the stereo bus, so we can use that. Let's get this back again as well. both short-term and integrated, will do the job. So minus 23, minus 24-ish. And now I'll disable the equalizer, refresh the supervision and go again. Minus 23, minus 
minus 24-ish. So I've not introduced any arbitrary additional volume, that's just EQ that I'm hearing between the two. So that's the first test passed, but there are still more ways that we can examine this sound. Let's have a look at what we're actually doing. I'm going to use the channel comparison tool, and this is the advantage of having these two tracks side by side. We turn activate channel comparison on. 100% yeah, for your transparency is where it's at. And now I want my comparison channel to be a dry bass track. Now, when I get this playing, the blue um, zone is going to be the process track. The orange zone is going to be the dry track. And you'll visually see the difference between the two um, EQ shapes. Just press play then without realizing I hadn't um, unmuted all of my changes, thinking, why do those two curves look identical? Okay, so blue is processed and you can see orange, see all of this extra energy in the in the base region is just a waste of time, frankly. That's a really big one there. That's an awful lot of energy. A lot of your hundred tokens, your energy points have been spent on generating tone. Down there, it's almost inaudible. It's basically just adding energy to the sound with very little value and therefore you're wasting your money. We have a look at the, from the dry perspective, you can see that we've got a blue halo around the 100 hertz-ish region. That's what we've accentuated. And we've also got the upper um, string pick that, we, that we've pulled out, but nothing else is visible. So for the most part, the dry track is almost exclusively louder than the process track, but we've compensated for that by boosting just the frequencies that we're interested in hearing. So that's really good. That's just a visual representation of what we've done and a good kind of confirmation that the principles that we're trying to achieve have been accomplished from a kind of a science perspective. The next problem we've got is this quiet note. Let's try to even some of the sounds out. Well, we're gonna use a compressor to accomplish that. So I'll put the compressor second in my chain just for clarity. If we hop over to the channel strip and press edit, then we get the vintage compressor options. So this is a, a loose emulation of a um, UA1176 compressor, really famous. And four to one is your basic go-to compression ratio. There's not often much reason to, to look beyond it and it's certainly going to suffice for this for the purposes of today don't want to get too deep into compression as a concept but let's try to get a little bit of compressions and what we're basically going to do is squash everything boost the level very slightly and so the discrepancy between the low notes um, so my quiet notes and my louder notes are um, de-emphasize the difference so we're looking for a decent amount of gain reduction Ooh, without going too loud. So there's a reasonable amount of compression that's being applied. And I'm starting to have a look at my short term level. Integrated no use at this point because it's been running too long. But short term is always basically three seconds behind and so it's a good indicator of what I'm aiming for, minus 23-ish is my target. And then for attack and release, just very quick mention, for bass guitar, for live stuff like this, a fairly slow attack, because we want to let all of the natural transient of the sound, the plucked string, we want to let most of that come through. And after about, I mean, I'm just really plucking numbers out of the sky here, but 20, 30, 40 milliseconds, most of that good stuff is done at a very, very brief moment in time when all of those transients are taking place. Let all of that through and then catch the, the sound before it starts to fade away and basically just give it a lift. So a nice slow attack so that we're not being too brutal with the sound and a release fast enough to get out of the way before the next note gets plucked. So let's watch the compression being applied. Don't worry that it's too quiet at the moment. So you can see after the compressor kicks in, it then fades away. The amount of compression that's being applied basically tails away.
and now let's start dialing the output up till we get to the minus 23 that we're looking for. So on the quieter notes, it's compressing less. There's less less work for the compressor to do, but the makeup gain is still giving it that push. Whereas on the louder notes that are like too loud, they're being pulled down, but that overall compression thing is still being done. So we've literally just squashed all the notes together. So this is the process track. a little bit more boost. Process track's a bit too quiet. No problem. And now on the process track, you'll see that compressor effect taking place. It's holding those highs a little bit longer and then they're kind of fading slowly away. See these high peaks are just a little bit sluggish to get out of the way. And there's the unprocessed muddy effect. Now, I'm not saying that any of this is absolutely smacking you in the face. The point of what we're trying to do is actually quite subtle. But all of these things over the course of the mix, every one of these tracks that we process um, is going to just overall improve the sound. Everything that we're doing is constructive, is positive. So let's clean everything up, get rid of the dry track, rename this to the proper name, turn all of my defeats off. And let's have a listen to a few bars of that from the start of the song. Now I have to decide what the appropriate overall level of the bass mix is in, in relation to the drums. Everything that I've done has been comparing processed with unprocessed. Now the bass needs to sit properly with those drums. It's a little bit loud to my ears. Excellent stuff, that's the base done. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please hit the like button uh, and join me for the next one. See you then.